Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is my very first reading roundup for March Mystery Madness. In this video I am going to be talking about the books that I've read during this first week of March Mystery Madness and I'm going to update you on my bingo card. But first I'm going to give you the answer to yesterday's My March Mystery Madness Mindbender. The clue was what long-running series will always be incomplete because the author died before writing the final book? And the answer is the Kinsey Milhone series by Sue Grafton. Why is for yesterday is the final book in the series and we will not be getting Zed, which is very unfortunate. I love this series by Sue Grafton and um, I have all of them and I, I plan to do a reread soon. I haven't read them in a while since the, I, I read this one last year, I think. Anyway, uh, so yeah, if you've never checked out the Sue Grafton series, Kinsey Milhone is a private investigator in the United States in California and the series is set in the 80s, which I really love. I think that is a really great um, time period and uh, a really fascinating time period to put a private investigator into. So uh, let's get on to the books that I've been reading for March Mystery Madness. So the first book that I picked up, I wanted to get started on it right away because it is huge. And this is an instance of The Finger Post by Ian Pears. Now this is almost, almost 700 pages, 685 pages. So I wanted to start that right away um, and I am not super far into it. I'm only just over 100 pages into it, but I am really enjoying it so far. This book um, I am reading for the five words in a title, five words in the title prompt, um, an instance of the finger post. But it also has a few other prompts that I could use if I wanted to. Pairs has five letters. Um, there are 685 pages, which means that it's divisible by five or it also technically has five in the, in the page number. So there's a number of different prompts I could have gone with uh, for that. But um, for my bingo card purposes, I'm gonna go with five words in the title. Now, this is a historical mystery set in 1663 in Oxford. It is set during one of my favorite time periods and in one of my favorite places. This is a reread for me, but it has been years since I've read this and so I really don't remember very much. There are four different narrators in here. There are four parts to the book and each part is narrated by somebody else. It's a little bit reminiscent that way of the Moonstone. So I am on the first part. The first narrator is Marco da Cola um, and he is a gentleman from Venice who is visiting England. So, it is 1663 and England is wrapped with intrigue and civil strife. When an Oxford Don is murdered, it seems at first that the incident can have nothing to do with great matters of church and state. Who poured the arsenic into the victim's brandy? The evidence points to Sarah Blundy, a servant girl. She confesses to the crime and is sentenced to be hanged. Yet little is as it seems in this gripping novel which dramatizes the ways in which witnesses can see the same events yet remember them falsely. Each of the four narrators, a Venetian medical student, a young man intent on proving his late father innocent of treason, a cryptographer, and an archivist, they each have a different suspect or a different culprit. So I'm going to keep reading this throughout the month and so far I'm really enjoying it. Next up, I went for a very different size of book and I read Death in Five Boxes by Carter Dixon and this is for the prompt of having the number five um, or the word five in the title on the cover. Um, this is a book from 1938 and when I started to look into it I discovered that this book actually fulfills five prompts. So in a way I feel like this is the ultimate March Mystery Madness read for me. Uh, it is a Sir Henry Merrillville mystery. It says up here, and that is five words. The victim has five letters in their name. 
and the victim is Felix Hay. Felix has five letters. There are five suspects in this book and the word five is on the cover and also the letters F-I-V-E are also on the cover and not even just taking that from the word five, but there is an F, an I, a V, and an E. So this is my ultimate March Mystery Madness read. I loved this book. This was a great story. A cozy late evening party, a cocktail or two, and a nasty murder. So begins the baffling case of the killing of Felix Hay. Five people had a motive, but not one had the opportunity to poison the drinks, and poisoned they were. Chief Inspector Humphrey Masters clamors from cl for clues from Egyptian mummies and clever clerks, while Sir Henry Merrigle silently spots the Le Jardin, and it's sure to be old Sir Henry who pulls out the missing pieces from this puzzling package of death in five boxes. We are first introduced to uh, Dr. John Sanders works in forensics. He works at the Harris Institute of Toxicology and he's been doing some experiments, doing some work, and he's left the office very late at night. It's like one o'clock in the morning. And he's walking home and he is accosted by a girl on the street in front of a building. And this building has a couple of floors, some offices, and um, at least a couple of flats, maybe just one flat at the top. And she is freaking out. She wants to get inside. She, she thinks her father's in there and that something is terribly wrong. And so Dr. Sanders goes inside with her and uh, she says that her father was at a party on um, at the apartment, the flat on the top floor. And so he goes inside and um, First of all, they discover, they trip over a umbrella that's on the stairs on the way up and he sees right away that it's a sword stick umbrella <clears throat> and it's, it's got blood on it. So he, he keeps hold of that and as they continue up, they come, um, they meet a man coming out of one of the offices and he's drying his hands on a towel and he says he's a clerk in the office and his boss is also in this um, at this party in the flat upstairs. And so when Dr. Sanders goes in, he discovers a very bizarre scene. And let me read this part because it's so interesting. Sanders' first impression was that he was looking at a waxworks or a group of stuffed figures in a rich shell of a room with mural paintings on either side of the fireplace. Four dummies sat in various broken attitudes at a long refectory table. At the foot of the table was a handsome woman in an evening gown with her head nearly on her shoulder. At one side of the table sprawled an old man with coarse whitish hair. At the other side was a middle-aged man sitting bolt upright. Finally, at the head of the table sat an immense, fat, jovial-looking man with a tonsure of red hair. He looked like a dissipated monk and dominated them all. The window frames shook to the rumble of a lorry in the street below. The silent company vibrated a little. Dead? Not quite, anyhow. Even in the doorway, Sanders could hear strange breathing. He went softly across to the woman whose ringed hand was cut on a broken cocktail glass. Her pulse was very rapid, well over 120. Her skin had a patchy reddish look. He lifted one of her eyelids and understood. The pupil of the eye was so dilated that it left only a narrow ring round the iris. So what he discovers is four people sitting around a table and they have all been drugged. But one of those four people is dead. And what makes it so interesting is Felix Hay had not died of poison. Felix Hay had died of a stab through the back with a long, narrow blade like a sword stick. Fascinating setup. Four people around a table, they've all been drugged, one of them is dead, but he was not poisoned, he was stabbed through the back. So this was such a great setup. I was really, really intrigued and interested. Also, there was a hilarious moment here. Um, on page 30, Sanders says, 
It's the one time we can accuse the police of getting their ideas from detective stories. The inspector always says to the chemist, analyze this, and the chemist in the story walks into his laboratory, immediately walks out again, and reels off the smallest measurements of the most obscure poison. Have you any idea how long this sort of work takes? And I laughed out loud because this book was from 1938. So apparently the CSI effect um, started much earlier than we thought. Anyway, I loved this read. It was great. Um, and I really, really enjoyed this book. And I highly recommend uh, Death in Five Boxes if you like Golden Age Mysteries, if you like Impossible Crimes. Um, it was a really great read. Next up, I read Alana Knight's The Balmoral Incident. And this was for the prompt of a book set during a year with five in the number. And this book was set in 1905. Rose McQuinn is the main character in this series. She is a lady investigator. Her tagline is lady investigator, discretion guaranteed. Her stepbrother Vince is a physician to the royal household. Her husband Jack is senior detective inspector McMary of the Edinburgh City Police. So this is set in Scotland and she goes with her daughter and um, a friend of her stepbrother's wife. They go for a visit to Balmoral. So her brother, stepbrother Vince is a, is a physician to the royal household and they are currently at Balmoral. And so he's arranged, Vince has arranged for them to have a little holiday. There's a cottage on the estate and so Rose goes with her daughter and initially Vince's wife and his daughter were supposed to be there as well and um, that's why his wife's friend Olivia, um, no his wife's name is Olivia, his wife's friend Mabel, Mabel Penby Worth, that's quite the name. So she came as well because she wanted to, to visit her old school friend Olivia but then Olivia and the daughter weren't able to come on the trip, but Mabel still, um, still sticks around. So um, this book started off a little bit slowly for me. The first chapter was all reminding the reader of the backstory, which is helpful, but I prefer when that's interspersed throughout the story with a little bit of action. So it felt like it was a bit of a slow start for me. Olivia's friend, Mabel Penworth, um, Mabel Penby Worth um, is Olivia's best friend from school days. She's also a suffragette, so that there were some interesting pieces in there about um, the suffragettes and their fight for the vote at that time period. So the I think it was the day after they arrived, there was a death on the estate. One of the estate workers was found in the river, and it was just an accident. He had fallen in. But right away, uh, things kind of start off a little bit uh, um, uncomfortably for their, for their vacation. Murder does happen, but it takes place about halfway through the book, so you have to wait a long time. There's a lot of setup, there's a lot of descriptions of um, tension and, and stuff like that. I found for being a lady investigator, Rose didn't actually do a lot of investigating. Now granted, she was warned off by her stepbrother, by her husband, who appears a few times throughout, throughout the book, and by Inspector Gray, uh, who is there for unknown reasons. He won't tell, he won't tell Rose. The other thing that that I didn't really like so much was that the biggest glue clue that she finds happens completely by accident. So this was an okay read for me. It certainly wasn't my favorite. Um, I liked the setting. I liked that it was set in um, in Scotland, and it was it was fine. There was nothing terrible with it, but it was certainly not my favorite read. Um, but I do I do enjoy this series, and I would read more from them. And next up, I read Emma in the Night by Wendy Walker. This was to fulfill the prompt of a victim's name beginning with an E. This book is from 2018, and Emma uh, is a, the victim in this book. And so, two sisters vanish, one, only one comes back. 
Getting people to believe you is easy if you tell them what they want to hear. When my sister and I disappeared three years ago, they found Emma's car at the beach. Some people believed she had gone there to find a party or meet a friend who never showed. They believed that she'd gone for a swim. They believed that she'd drowned. Maybe by accident, maybe a suicide. Everyone believed Emma was dead. As for me, well, now I'm back to tell our story. You'll have to see if you believe me. This one has alternating chapters. They would have, there would be a chapter from Cassandra Tanner in first person and she was one of the sisters that disappeared three years ago and she comes back in the very first chapter. She shows up on the doorstep of her mother's house. And then alternating with uh, chapters about Dr. Abigail Winter who is a forensic psychologist with the FBI her chapters were written in third person. So there was, that was something interesting right off the top. From the back, the description on the back, and then the fact that Cassandra's chapters were told in first person, and the um, chapters about Dr. Abigail Winter were told in the third person, that set me up to start thinking that, that Cassandra was gonna be an unreliable narrator. And that really affected my reading of this story there was a lot about narcissistic personality disorder in here, which is really interesting. I don't actually know very much about that. That part was really interesting. I also thought that it was interesting that Cassandra only ever referred to her mother as my mother, our mother, or Mrs. Martin. She never called her mom or or even just straight mother it was my mother our mother or mrs martin there was a lot in here about people see what they want to see or we believe what we want to believe which was interesting um i guessed part of the ending but not all of it um and the family was extremely dysfunctional so this book was was good. Um, it wasn't my favorite though. I think um, I think I don't know. The family was just a little too dysfunctional for for me. Um, but if you like a good thriller, uh, you might want to check out Emma in the Night by Wendy Walker. And then finally, I've also started reading uh, uh, Bally Conspiracy Most Foul by Shamini Flint. This is an Inspector Singh investigates the second in the series. I'm a little over halfway through, so I am going to finish this today. I, I'm going to count it for March Mystery Madness. It wasn't on my TBR, but I can't renew it from the library, so I had to read it. So I'm going to find a way to make it fit somewhere um, for the prompts and on my on my bingo card. And this, um, I started reading this series a few months ago. Um, I'm doing an around the world reading challenge, and so the first book in this series is set in Malaysia and that was why I picked it up and I quite enjoyed it so I got the second one from the library and this one is set in Bali which is in Indonesia so I'm going to count that for my around the world challenge as well. Inspector Singh is from Singapore and he gets sent to Bali in this story mostly because his superiors want to get rid of him they they just don't really like him um, but he is actually a very good detective. So he gets sent to Bali because there have been some terrorist bombings. He has no expertise in terrorism, terrorism or bombings, um, but they send him anyway because they want him out of their way. He gets partnered with a girl, a woman called Bronwyn, who is a police officer from Australia. Um, there's a, a whole group of, of police officers from Australia who've come over to help as well and the two of them get tasked with investigating a murder that happened amongst the, all the victims of the bombings. They discover a man who was shot with a bullet and so that's what they're investigating which I find really interesting. I'm really enjoying this, this story so far and um but i haven't finished it yet so i can't give you my my final thoughts so that's what i've been reading when i picked up the first book to read for march mystery madness i suddenly thought of a fun another fun game to play and that would be for each book that i read for march mystery madness i would look for 
a word in the fifth chapter on the fifth page on the fifth line the fifth word and for each book I would collect that word and then see if I could create a sentence from the words that I have collected and so I've been collecting them on these post-it notes and I've been doing it I've been keeping them on the wall so I can rearrange them and try and and uh, create a sentence and so the words that I have so far are hers lights said am and remarkable so so far I can't make a sentence I'm gonna have to read a few more books uh, but this is just a fun little game I've been playing and if you want to play along it uh, it's just for fun so find the word in the fifth chapter on the fifth page of chapter five fifth line fifth word and so I, I'm gonna see what I can do by the end of the month to see if I can come up with a sentence from those words so another just for fun thing uh, that I enjoy doing and it's a good excuse to use some fun post-it notes and I'm gonna update you on my March Mystery Madness bingo card so as you can see I have filled in four of the squares I haven't yet got a bingo uh, but I think I'm doing pretty good so that's my wrap up for my first week of reading what have you been reading this week have you been enjoying March Mystery Madness I've been loving it I think um, it is such a fun reading month, such a fun challenge. I've enjoyed watching other March Mystery Madness videos on BookTube and uh, participating in some of the other things that have been going on. It's been really fun. So before I, I uh, say goodbye, I'm going to give you my March Mystery Madness mind bender for today's video. Which Lord Peter Whimsey novel is set in Oxford and doesn't include a murder? So put your answers in the comments down below. I've been loving uh, looking at your your uh, comments and that you've been participating in this Mind Better game. And also let me know what have you been reading this week? Uh, have you been loving it? How have you, how have you been doing fulfilling prompts? And I'll see you again tomorrow for another March Mystery Madness video. Bye.